Good morning. We're about to get started. Thank you for joining us um, at our panel on fast, friendly, and effective disruptive tools in philanthropy. We are grateful to you for making the time. I know there are a lot of competing agendas, especially at SOCAP, and that it's so wonderful to be back together. So we're grateful to you for making the time to join us today. I'm Casey Vanderstrick. I'm principal of Solve Innovation Future, which is the philanthropic venture vehicle associated with MIT Solve. Solve is a marketplace for impact and innovation. We find entrepreneurs from around the world who are laser focused on solving the world's most pressing problems, and we connect them with transformational partnerships that support scale. So you'll hear, I'm sure, more about Solve, and we'd be happy to talk more about our work at another point in time. But in the interim, I'm thrilled to share the stage today with two of our friends and partners, Lindsay Androsky, Androsky and Arti Chandna. Um, both Arti and Lindsay are really thoughtful folks who are using philanthropic capital in innovative and renewable ways. And I think part of the reason we are here today is that for better or for worse, we often introduce complexity into the work. And our focus has been on how can we make this simpler? How can we use philanthropic capital to drive disruption in entrepreneurship and effective transformation in entrepreneurship, but do it in a really simple and replicable and scalable way? So we'll hear us talk a lot about that. So that you have a sense of what the session will look like, we'll do Q and A's for, sorry, we will share a panel Q and A for the first sort of two thirds of the panel and then we'll open up um, to questions. So if you have anything on your mind, let us know and we'll open up for, our, um, for comments from the audience at the end of the session. So do keep that in mind. So let's get started. Let me introduce our panelists to you. Um, Arti is an impact investor and strategy consultant working with early stage for-profit social impact ventures. Given her deep passion for social change and empowerment, Arti mentors social entrepreneurs and invests in companies driving change. She leads Impact Investing for Silicon Valley Social Venture Fund, where she is a partner, and is on the board of trustees at Case Western Reserve University. She also serves on the board of directors, directors at Peninsula Bridge and Shine Together, and is on the advisory board for the Center for Asian Health and Research at Stanford Medical School, and the advisory board at the Miller Center at Santa Clara University, where she is also an adjunct lecturer. Arti previously held positions at information technology and led global IT teams at several tech companies, uh, including Oracle, Hitachi, Coherent, Autodesk, and Nikon. Um, we are so thrilled to have Arti here today. Lindsay is the founder and president and CEO of Roy Vent Social Ventures, a social impact organization that makes early stage investments and incubates biotechs, fo biotechs focused on improving healthcare access and outcomes for underserved groups. Ms. Androsky, Androsky currently serves on the president as the president of Incubate, an advocacy, advocacy organization that educates policymakers on the critical role of early stage venture capital in biopharma. She's also a member of the MIT Board of Trustees and sits on the MIT Visiting Committees for Sponsored Research, Department of Biology, and the Department of Humanities. Lindsay also has a bunch of other really fun pieces in her background that I will let her share if they are relevant, um, including working as prosecutor at various points in time. So um, happy to share more about that. But to start, I would love if, Lindsay, why don't you start sharing a little bit about Royven and sort of the idea behind Royven and, and the structure. Thanks, Casey. So Royvan Social Ventures is an entity I launched because I saw a gap in uh, the early stage development of drugs that particularly could be helpful for unmet needs or underserved patient populations. And I saw an opportunity to do corporate philanthropy in a better way. So Royvan Social, Royvan Sciences is the company that spun out Royvan Social Ventures. I was part of the founding team there. Um, and what we did there on the for-profit side is actually take in drugs that someone else had invented but weren't going to bring all the way to patients. We then launched and uh, incubated new biotechs. Um, and in that was, I joined in uh, 2016. They were a little bit older than that. Um, but uh, to date, we have five approved drugs from this method. So it's a method that we know works. Um, and as time went on, I saw that two things, really. First was that we were saying no to investments that we would have said yes to in the early days. And the reason we were saying no is because we had a curse of success. We had too much money to deploy, and we had to get you know high enough returns for our investors. Um, and so... I thought to myself, we're looking at program. A lot of times, there's there's a big overlap between the things that aren't profitable enough to invest in when you model it out, and the things that can really help underserved groups, because it's often Medicaid patients or it's a small patient population 
or things like that. And I thought to myself, what is a model that we could adopt that would allow us to say yes to those projects and use our expertise in diligencing, in uh, bringing drugs forward to patients and get to yes. And so at the same time, we were growing, uh, Royal Red Sciences was growing as an organization and we didn't have a corporate foundation. So I pitched the idea of launching Roy Vance Social Ventures instead of a traditional foundation. So the, the difference is that um, we are uh, a public charity, so we're focused on um, underserved groups, unmet patient needs, but my staffing is volunteers from Roy Vance Sciences. So as opposed to, you know, fluffy uh, type of corporate foundation initiatives that we, uh, that we see sometimes, um, the employees at Roy Vance Sciences actually get to work on, work with uh, social entrepreneurs, work with startup companies, and um, it has really improved uh, employee satisfaction. They are very, they feel very engaged to making a difference, and I think this is extremely important in today's world where we see so many people job hopping or lying flat because they're looking for more professional fulfillment. So one of the things I try to do is encourage other companies to adopt this model of corporate philanthropy. Terrific, thank you. And I think part of the reason I should add that we put this panel together was you have MIT acting as an academic institution um, and thinking about philanthropy in new and regenerative ways, a corporate who's thinking about philanthropy in new and innovative ways to drive transformative entrepreneurship, and then Arthi, who you're doing this on your own. So tell us a little bit about the structures that you use to, to fund these entrepreneurs. Yeah, so I do a variety of, of things. Um, so I do, uh, you know, Silicon Valley Social Venture Fund was started by Laura Ariaga and Andreessen, and we have a for-profit and a non-profit side. I'm more on the for-profit side. So we invest in for-profit social ventures, and we're sector agnostic. So we get to see a variety of really good companies out there who need seed funding, who can do well, but cannot get your regular VC funding. I do the same, I have my own family foundation and I invest again in various companies on the social, uh, you know, it's, for me it's more tech for good when I do it personally. Um, again, I do those as PRIs. So in both cases we're using philanthropic money to uh, seed these great companies, some of which like what Lindsay said, but in every sector, whether it be femtech, ag tech, elder tech, whatever tech you want to think about, <laughs> justice tech, all of those. And uh, there's, a, I've actually invested in uh, two of MIT Solve companies. One of them was my mentee, um, and that's Justice Text, and the other one is Med Hall, uh, who was also in the Miller Center Accelerator, where I am on the advisory board and also um, was on a panel for that particular company. So there are many good ones out there. There's a lot happening, and your philanthropic money can be reused. And this is something that most of us don't think about. When we make a donation, you're giving your money and it's gone. Gone in the sense it's gone for a good deed, but it's gone. Whereas if you were to invest it as a, a, a returnable grant, or if you were to invest as a PRI or any of those kinds of vehicles, your money comes back and you can put it to good use over and over and over again. So it's a pot that doesn't empty out. So that's, you know, wh one of the things that I like is I can reuse it. The other thing is with both for-profits and non-profits, a non-profit doesn't have to be a charitable organization in the sense that it needs money all the time. You can be a, gen uh, a revenue generating uh, non-profit, which is a good way for people to do things because you are encouraging them to be self-sufficient. And you can give small loans. There are various ways to do this. So yeah, I believe in uh, catalytic investments and the money coming back and being reused. And what's, that's a nice segue, Arti, because what we at Solve, we saw an opportunity to effectively leverage what Arti has put, out, put forward and Lindsay has put forward with respect to an, a way to use philanthropic dollars in a new way. And we married that with what we were hearing from the Solver team. So Solver teams are typically 
seed stage entrepreneurs slightly earlier, slightly later, based on a bell curve, who are working in, in four sectors, health, economic prosperity, learning, and sustainability. And often, they may have raised a small amount of money, sometimes from philanthropy, non-dilutive capital is great for all of those entrepreneurs. But as they look to make the jump from the sort of pre-seed or seed stage to their first institutional round, there really is a, a, not a lot of funding available for those teams, and the funding that is available is very competitive to get. And so what we've tried to do is set up Solve Innovation Future to really marry these two pieces of feedback that we heard. One, that philanthropy is looking for new ways to deploy regenerative capital, and two, that somehow entrepreneurs still aren't getting that capital, so how do we create a vehicle that allows those two goals to be achieved? Um, so Solve Innovation Future is actually structured as a donor advised fund, where we're taking gifts to solve, depositing them in a donor advised fund, and then directing uh, a combination of traditional and alternative investments in teams, equity, debt, revenue-linked financing, um, et cetera. And proceeds from those investments go back into the fund and back into future solver teams. And that's important for us because the philanthropic capital allows us to take the risk and have the multi-strategy perspective of structuring the right investment for the right entrepreneur based on their goals. So some of those teams are going to be super high growth venture investments. Some of them want to own or operate or have a brick and mortar strategy that just requires a slightly different source of capital um, or, or capital expectation. And I'm wondering, Artie, maybe we'll start with you. When you, who are the right uh, innovators to sort of work within these frameworks using the philanthropically sourced capital with the more traditional investment structures? Why do those, why do those entrepreneurs like working with you, whether it's Justice Text or some other uh, innovator? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's very difficult for social entrepreneurs to get funding easily from a VC because they have a mission, they're impact first, they do want to make money, and many of them do return uh, at market rate. But it is difficult for them to get that first level of uh, seed funding. So they prefer working with people who understand them, who understand that it's a mission that they're really after. And uh, again, it is patient, uh, it's a patient investment. You're not going to get your money back in most cases very quickly because that's not the purpose. So uh, hence they like working with impact investors who think like them, but more so, those who get involved with their mission and who can help them in other ways other than just writing a check. Uh, so some of them ask for grants. Many of them don't want grants because with a grant, what happens is they have to do what the grant requires them to do. So oftentimes they just prefer getting VC type money, but getting it from a, you know, a venture investor. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, from an impact investor. So that's an easier thing for them. The difference, uh, you know, in the two monies, the way I look at it is when you make a program-related investment or a PRI, you are expecting a market rate return. You want the money to come back. If it's a grant that you're giving them, e even if it's a loan or a grant, that's uh, a grant that you get the money back, even in that case, oftentimes it's catalytical and you're okay with not getting the level of return that you want. But it's easier for them to talk to us because we understand them. And Lindsay, did they understand you internally when you went to go pitch this idea as, as starting Royvent? It was uh, it was an interesting discussion. Um, uh, it was with our CEO and founder, and um, he was ultimately pretty enthusiastic. Um, the reason being that he uh, feels that a lot of corporate philanthropy is just lip service, and what I was pitching was a way where we can use our professional expertise to help advance important programs that we weren't going to do as a for-profit venture. So that was really what made it compelling. Um, and for the companies, it's the same thing that RT just said. Uh, we know we have a track record of success. They are working with experts um, who we can staff as advisors. And uh, often um, we can either just incubate or we can give an investment or we can do both. 
in, when we do give an investment, it's exactly uh, as, as RT described, it is, we are the first, we're usually the first non-grant money in, so we will do a convertible note or take some equity, and um, we are knowledgeable, we can help guide them, uh, and we understand the mission focus, and because we are a nonprofit with a very clear mission focus, they know we're aligned with them, so it's a very nice hybrid of the professional expertise and the mission focus. And I think this group was probably uh, interested in what those structures exactly look like. So you referenced convertible note. Have you had to build any goofy things into your convertible note docs to actually get the money out the door? Or can you, how does that work? So no, we haven't had to. We're, we, the, the convertible notes look like pretty standard, to. but I like to. <laughs> yeah, so so one, one of our initiatives, um, so we picked three focus areas uh, of uh, what are what is the ultimate impact that we want to see in any of the drugs that are developed using our assistance? Um, and and they are making sure that there is timely global access to any drug that is approved, uh, making sure that any clinical trials that are run accurately reflect the real world patient population, meaning diverse patients, and data transparency. I could talk all day about data transparency and all of the lost, uh, you know, progress that I think is happening from all the studies that are run preclinically, clinically, and then siloed in biotechs and pharma companies and the government and never made publicly available. So we will embed requirements to do all three of those things. And then what we're working on now, our, our companies will, we write fairly small checks, um, and they need to graduate from us to traditional investors, for-profit investors. So we are building a consortium of like-minded impact investors who also care about those things, who will back us up in the next round or join us with follow-on funding and support um, keeping those socially-minded provisions in. We're very careful to structure them in a way that is not bad for business. So, you know, you need to make your data available at a time that is not going to jeopardize the, you know, patents or the, the profitability. Um, but we want those things to be embedded from day one. In my past life at Royal Med Sciences, I built and led our deal team. So I have lots of experience of taking in deals that have weird provisions in them. And I know firsthand that we'll say, oh, okay, are we going to lose money on this? No, then let, we'll do it. Um, and so I'm trying to embed that early on for others. I, that's, this is, I think, where the field will go. And Artie, I want to pick your brain on, on working with that collaborative of impact investors, but I'll share an anecdote from Solve. Um, we recently executed a transaction uh, where we're supporting an AI platform for medical supply chains. The team is extremely focused on impact, extremely focused on trying to serve the hardest to serve. They're also working with DARPA, which is terrific, but could go a number of different ways and may be slightly outside our scope, um, depending on, on which kind of project takes off. And we started to really explore what can we add to the deal terms to actually ensure not only that impact is inculcated into the DNA of the organization, but also what does that mean from an investment perspective in the long run? And it really was looking at the capital stack and saying, okay, there are other investors who have a similar perspective, and can we actually build in some tag-along rights so that we could, we could exit at the same time as management should that uh, that uh, ac that ex activity happen. Um, so I think what's what's interesting to me is that's not wildly complex. That's building off of existing documentation and makes it easier for founders to then go out in their next round because they're not getting some wackadoodle new document. They're actually just getting a convertible note with a side letter, and there are ways of working through that as you move along the capital continuum. But RT, I'd love to, as a network builder, to, if you could share a little bit about how, how you think about building that community around um, an investee. Yeah, so m most, most of the investees need capital from various people who can help them in various ways, right? So we also do mostly convertible notes because that's the easiest way for them, or also if, they, you know, or using YC is safe. Uh, that's the easiest way for them to in invest. But they need much more than capital. So it is, again, when we look for other investors who we can invest together with, we are looking for skill sets that the others may have that we don't have, or pull in others who can help these uh, entrepreneurs 
get to the next level. It, what I've found is that one of the hardest things is their business model. They have you know, a good heart and they have a great mission, but it has to be a business model that's scalable. It has to be a business model that makes money. And if it doesn't do that, they're not going to uh, get future funding. And many of them don't realize that. Uh, very many of them are very academic because they, you know, they come come from different backgrounds. So just um, it's diff being an entrepreneur is not an easy thing. So they need this whole the whole village with them who can help them be true entrepreneurs. And I think some of the best ones are who are willing to give up the CEO title if they need to when they go for further funding, because it's not always that easy for them. Uh, we also tie their uh, metrics are important. Any kind of data, I'm, I'm a big data person. So data is really important. What is it that you're doing? What is the outcome? How, you know, what's happening? That's on the their product side of it, but also, or their services or whatever it is, but we also need impact metrics, and that's that's important. We oftentimes will tie these metrics to uh, SDGs um, and see how that works. But yes, they do need a lot of handholding and advice. And I like the idea uh, that Casey just you know you need you need a whole cohort of people helping them. Yeah, and I think the the. The cohort idea is probably this audience is probably interested in how do you how do you build that cohort or how do you access that both from a deal perspective and a post investment perspective. How Lindsay, how do you guys go about finding your deals? If, and if there were philanthropists or other corporates that were trying to find deals, where do you start? We are lucky enough to not have a problem with <laughs> with deal flow. Brilliant Science's name was was well enough known where people reach out to us. Um, and so, uh, and refer others. And so that has not been an issue. That said, my VP of investments still spends a lot of time going to conferences and meeting new people because we do want to expand the network, especially we're focused on, you know, underserved uh, populations. It's not great to have only referrals from our known network. Um, and so we, uh, we make efforts there. Um, on the, the coalition side of impact investing, that's actually where we're spending a lot of our time and efforts right now because we didn't know that world. We didn't know this world coming from, you know, for-profit biotech investing. And, um, you know, we've, we are working with the World Health Organization Foundation and other groups that, that have tentacles into a lot of places that can introduce us to investors that are like-minded, equally focused on things like prompt global access to approved medicines and stuff like that. And so a lot of my efforts now are, are finding our, uh, our people um, so that we can you know, build a more systematized uh, cha a channel, basically, of you know, where does the funding go after, after we step in. And RJ, are you, do you see any, I'm curious whether the, the coalition, I heard yesterday actually two separate perspectives on the, the wrapper around some of these investments is best if it's community-based or place-based. And then I heard, oh, it's actually better if it's sector-based. I'm curious if you have a perspective, um, knowing that you are a part of a place-based community versus a sector-based community in terms of how to support entrepreneurs. So we, we are sector agnostic and we are also place agnostic in the sense, as long as it has impact, you know, that. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm speaking for Silicon Valley Social Venture Fund and myself personally as well. So, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Casey, your question. Oh, I'm just saying, once post investment, is it easier to say, here are other investors from Silicon Valley, or is it easier to say, here are all your, your ed tech? Uh, yeah, your I, I feel it's more, more than. Um, Place-based, it's easier if you're interested in ag tech, you find people interested in that or in healthcare or in femtech. So it's easier to work with investors who invest in a, a certain sector unless it is a problem that you're trying to solve, a community-based problem. Um, I've found that the community-based problems are slightly different than the types of investments that, that we do where we are investing in companies which tend to be more sector-based uh, than trying to solve a problem, a, you know, a poverty problem or a, a housing problem, those kinds of more community-based problems. Uh, it is, uh, 
it is important though to find like-minded investors because not only do you learn a lot from each other, your the entrepreneur learns a lot from you, but it's also good from a diligence purpose. It's not fair to the entrepreneur to make them do the same diligence over and over and over again. So I encourage people to work in cohorts again, especially investors so that you can share each other's diligence um, and take the burden off the entrepreneur and let them continue and do their work, which is what they should be doing. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And if you had asked me four years ago in 2019 when we launched Solve Innovation Future, we had a perspective that what was actually most helpful to entrepreneurs was being able to offer a solve deal like a YC safe or something else. And quickly what we learned was that for innovators, our ability to be a follower was actually very impactful and catalytic. And I'm excited to share that for every dollar we've invested, we've actually unlocked an additional $6 towards our investees because we've been able to be a follower. So because I care less about my position and I can get cut back a little bit given the source of philanthropic capital, I can be an impact focused co-investor and unlock you know, 10x my investment through participation in a round. Um, so I think that that point's really important, again, for scalability, the ability to be a follower and to not impose your own frameworks or your own deal terms on teams, even if we have to slightly adjust what those terms look like. Um, and I think it's also we've learned to a certain extent the role of intermediaries is important in this market. And if there's, you know, as we try to unlock philanthropic capital to drive towards some of these teams in a catalytic way, it's terrific to make big, big um, pledges with respect to these investments, hundreds of millions of dollars, but functionally getting those big pledges onto the ground often requires some sort of intermediary or some sort of group that is trying to put together 5, 10, 20 deals rather than 300 deals. So I wouldn't discount that for some of the smaller uh, folks in this room that intermediaries can be a really valuable way to try to get, get more deals done. Um, and I'm curious, you know, that's one barrier that I see of why there, why more philanthropy is not doing this work. Do either of you have a perspective on why more philanthropists or more corporates aren't looking for these types of deals? Is it just knowledge or is it something else? I think it's a combination of things. It's uh, not very many, uh, you know, foundations and philanthropies uh, have really been educated on what a program related investment is. It's better now than it was like four years ago, five years ago, people didn't know these things. Also, a lot of times the way that we have been taught philanthropy is you write a check and some, you know, the money goes for good use. Very rarely have we been, you know, we haven't grown up with the thought that philanthropy means you give money, but you get the money back so you can give the money back again, right? So it's a different way. Also, there weren't vehicles uh, previously. There weren't, there weren't DAFs like Impact Assets and other DAFs that allow you to invest philanthropic funds in for-profit companies through a DAF. There's more of those now. So I think the vehicles didn't exist. And I think in the last few years, as Impact Investing has become a more important thing, um, and you know, there is now return and people are seeing market rate return. I, there's new vehicles available. Uh, MIT Solve didn't have a fund like this in the past, uh, not at the Miller Center, and now they do. So it's, it's you know, it's a different, uh, these are new vehicles. Yeah, I have found that it's still confusing for people. And I think that it is because it's still relatively new. I've only been around for two years. Uh, and I find myself always educating uh, people about why we are structured the way we are. So a couple of common questions or objections I will get is, OK, well, you're associated with Roy Vance Sciences. Why doesn't Roy Vance Sciences just fund this program if it's important for patients? And then I have to explain that we say no to deals all the time because it's not money making enough at this point. Sometimes it can just be because it's early and you have to show proof of concept. We're happy to step in to get people to that stage. Um, but that's one thing I hear. And then from the donor side, it's it's exactly what RT was saying. The, we are, um, you know, the idea that you would donate charitable funds to us and we will invest them 
and then get repaid and redeploy them uh, is more confusing than I would have expected to people. I, when I talk about it, I say this is so exciting because we can build a self-sustaining charitable model that can make an impact. Your dollars can matter over and over again. But a lot of times, if people don't quite understand that because they think, well, when I give money to a charity, it just goes, it's used and it goes away. And then sometimes when people do get it, they say, oh, that's great, can I invest in your fund? And then I have to go back to explaining, well, we're, we're earlier than that. We're at, this, we're at the early stage when people aren't yet attractive to a fund. But you can certainly invest later, but please you know, support us charitably now. I think we see, we see, I'm nodding along because we, we have the same conversations and I think that's, the onus is on us to a certain extent, partially the reason we're here is to share more of the success stories um, and where, where this type of, of investment and support can work really well. And Lindsay pointed to some of them. I think what we, in terms of being too early, the other example that we often see, a deal that I often share is uh, we participated in an inter-series round with an asset management exchange platform lot of jargon in that language, but functionally this table could be used at another venue if that other venue knew that this table existed. So how can we better essentially share assets? This company came to us and they said, hey, we want to execute an inter-series round to build a carbon capture calculator into our platform. Corporates are now making pledges with respect to carbon remediation. We want to be able to measure the carbon remediation because someone used our platform and they reuse this table instead of getting rid of it and getting a new one. Can you help fund that as we go forth? Then that actually gives us a leg up as we go to sell more because we can say to companies, hey, you can actually track this. And that company has successfully raised a, a second follow-on round that was quite successful with a lot of investors that some of whom are probably in this room right now. Um, so I think it's really interesting. That is sort of a nirvana, right? Not every venture investor is going to say, yes, I'll do an inter-series round to build a carbon capture, capture catalog, excuse me, carbon capture calculator. Um, but we will. And that sets somebody up for a logarithmic growth in the future should they be successful um, in the interim. So those are the types of deals that we see that are, that are um, the kind of a perfect fit. Um, anything that I've missed before I open the floor to questions from, from our panelists? Anything that you would share if, or advice to give to philanthropists or to corporates or individuals that are looking to do more of this type of work? We were so exhaustive. There's no. <laughs> <laughs> there are questions on the chat. I don't have access to the chat, but we can. If someone does have a question, I we can raise hands and we'll repeat. We can repeat the question. I see a hand in the back. Yeah, we and we can repeat it. So the, the question was, especially in different geographies where there are family offices or foundations or community foundations that are interested in this type of work, where should we direct them? Yeah, so I learned a lot of this just uh, by reading stuff because I was interested in it. But if you look for, and I don't know where you're based out of, but like in the Bay Area, that's something that Silicon Valley Social Venture Fund does is where we teach people to be, you know, part of our thing is educating people on how you can deploy your monies because I learned from others who were doing it. Um, I also looked at the model of the Gates Foundation and that was, that was pretty helpful. Um, I invested very early in a company called Nepris, which had a great exit. 
And uh, again, they were funded by the Dell Foundation. And that's when I realized that there are foundations doing this, so why can my foundation not do this as well? So I've done several PRIs through my family foundation, but it was a lot of research and reading, really. Uh, but conferences like this would be helpful because you can network with others and see what they're doing. My inspiration initially was the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. So if anyone here is familiar with the biotech world, that is a very well-known success story in a nonprofit doing for-profit investments. A lot of patient advocacy groups, meaning folks focused on specific diseases, specific subpopulations sub that still have unmet needs are doing this. It's very clean and easy to understand um, because they fund medical research in the area they care about, and then when a drug is approved, they get repayments. And so the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has more money than they know what to do with because they funded what became Vertex's biggest drugs. So though you know you're, you might not be in biotech, that is a very clean story to use to, um, to educate someone about how PRIs can work. Yep. And I think the only other piece I would add is the Stanford Social Innovation Review often has a number of academic yes. articles that we've written one about donor advised funds and how to make direct investments out of donor advised funds. Um, there, there's a lot there that have pretty tack, it's pretty toolkit based with respect to here's what you would do for second and third. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mention that SSIR. That we, you know, we are very, we work very closely with them, and I've attended several of their conferences. But at the minimum, if you even just look at their newsletters and their magazine, it is hugely helpful. Yeah, so I have a lot of opinions on this. This is one of my favorites. So there's, first of all, there's some really cool models out there right now that we did not talk about today, frankly, because they're more complicated with respect to nonprofits owning for-profit entities that allow for that regenerative uh, work to stay within the community. I would point you to the Shorefast Foundation um, in, in Newfoundland. They're doing some really cool work that's explicitly focused on community development, and there's a big for-profit hotel that essentially offsets microloans in the community um, to do lots of small business, essentially community development. So those, I would say those exist, those are just slightly different than we're talking about. With respect to, and you guys may have a different opinion, but um, pulling money out versus leaving money, I actually would frame it slightly differently. I would say in the best scenario, it's an option to roll the grant forward. And my, my experience has been that many philanthropists or many folks executing either a PRI or a recoverable grant or an investment through a DAF often say, I just want to actually get more to the community. And by encouraging for-profits and nonprofits to have sustainable business models that could spin back the proceeds from the investment or the grant, that's actually helping the entity to become sustainable and giving me a chance to put it out again. And that you can structure options that would, like a checkbox, frankly, in some of these in a recoverable grant that would say, if you return, just put it back to work. And I think more often than not, investors often choose that, even philanthropists who are executing recoverable grants, rather than saying, okay, I'm gonna pull it out. And I think finally, it all depends on, it's scenario by scenario. So in some, some um, investments that we might make, it's about um, operating expenses and capital expenditure. And so if someone's trying to buy a facility to produce something, once they've done that, they should be sustainable. And that may be more appropriate than to grant that funding back, the proceeds back out to 
a local nonprofit, or it might say, okay, cool, let's do it again and build a second plant. So it sort of depends on what that end state objective is for the right structure for that reinvestment. We just got the five minute warning. I don't okay. know if you saw it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I see another, we'll do one more question. Yeah. 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 All three of us <laughs> like let us tell you more. Go ahead, Lindsay. Well, I was going to I was going to give an example of our first investment. And so to me the the focus should be on what is the end goal, what is the mission versus what is the vehicle that you're using. So our first investment was a spin out of MIT that is called Sunflower Therapeutics. And they had designed in a lab setting um, a way to manufacture flexibly, meaning you can change what you're manufacturing, um, vaccines, biologics, can be insulin, they're not there yet. Um, and this can be done in the size of a galley kitchen to support the city of Boston annually, and can be done by someone with a GED education. So their goal was to sell these to low and middle income countries to allow them to get off the global supply chain and support their own population with the drugs that they need. And our funding, which was their first non-grant funding, it was a, a convertible note, allowed them to manufacture their commercial prototype, which they have since sold. And now they have revenue um, and are pitching, you know, they're in discussions to sell these to the first low and middle income countries. And so at the stage they were at and with the goals that they had, they were not attractive to traditional investors. Um, and so we were able to do it in, in the way that sustains our organization, but very much focused on mission and, um, and ta something tan helping them get somewhere tangible that can then allow them to move to the next stage. So uh, could we have done it with a grant? Yes, but they're also trying to mature as a company. And, um, and so dealing with an, a friendly investor as their first investor is also important to these companies as they go you know, down the path to you know, broader uh, investment and commercialization. Yeah, the only thing I would add is we have a very robust capital market, right, with lots of different tools and it's still working in it's sort of a broad, uh, with a broad umbrella. The second piece is let's have a more robust philanthropic network that just allows us to recognize that Companies are taking lots of different forms now, for-profits, non-profits, hybrid, social enterprise. And so let's just come up with the right financing mechanism for those folks. And if philanthropy has, because it's earmarked for good, has a charitable orientation, then that is all the more flexible to say, it doesn't just have to be a grant that meets the needs of the philanthropist. It can be an investment or an instrument that meets the needs of, of the entrepreneur. And I see a one minute sign, so I'm not sure we should take any other questions. But anything that you would add before we? No, I, I totally agree with what both of, both of you said. Um, the way that I look at philanthropy is I, you know, it, we should keep giving. And if the money can come back, it doesn't come back to you as a philanthropist, it can come back to the organization you gave it to and make them more self sufficient so that they're not. It takes a lot of time and energy to go and ask for donations every single year. If they can become more self-sufficient and reuse the monies that was given to them once over and over again, I think that's a good thing, so yeah. That's certainly what we're trying to do. We're trying yeah. to keep the focus on the program's work rather than the continual fundraising. Well, thank you both so much for, for coming today, for sharing your experience. Thank you to you all for coming. We look forward to connecting with more of you. Thank you. Thanks.